That's great. Thank you, Melissa. Let's open our Bibles, if you will, to Ephesians in the fourth chapter. And we're looking at these passages that have to do with spiritual maturity. And here's the question, is this happening for you? Now notice what he says in these passages. He's speaking about spiritual gifts that are given to the church. And he makes this comment. Verse 11, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But the desire is to become mature. Now, in life, we measure ourselves in all different areas, or at least we should. Uh, these students in their school, they're going to be measured by tests that are administered. The teachers have to evaluate, are we making progress here or not? A student needs to know that. Their parents need to know it. But all of us, whether we think of that or whether we think of physical, we should be measuring ourselves physically. Unfortunately, a lot of people do not. Uh, this actor that was in The Sopranos, 51 years of age, died unexpectedly this week of a heart attack. And people need to stay in touch with, all right, uh, what kind of shape am I in physically? Get their blood checked, get their cholesterol checked. Or you think finances, people should evaluate our situation financially. Are we making progress? Are we doing the things we need to do? All these things are so very important. But especially is that true in the spiritual realm of life? And yet I would dare say there's scores of people, they don't have any earthly idea where they stand spiritually. They don't know how to measure their life spiritually. And that's the benefit of these verses, as we'll see in another message. There are ways here that you can measure your life. But the whole thrust of the scripture here, it's not just in these passages, but in others, stresses to us the importance of maturity. And so this question comes to all of us, is it happening for you? Are you maturing in your faith? Well, a couple of things we want to know today in this study. First of all, it is this. It's the will of God that you mature as a believer. Now, a lot of people, especially when they're young people, always talk about the will of God, but adults should as well. Now, what's God's will for my life? Well, I can tell you something real quick. It is God's will, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that you mature in your faith. That is one of the main planks in His platform for what He wants to be accomplished in your life, that you be maturing in your faith. And the Bible gives so many verses that will illustrate this to us. Uh, Ephesians, you're in that. Look right over here a couple of pages to Philippians. And look what it says in Philippians, the third chapter. Now here's the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul has not just made a decision for Christ. He's not just come off the Damascus Road where he had that blinding light experience. And Christ called him. No, this is years later. He served the Lord faithfully for years. And now he's in prison, and he's towards the end of his life. And if you think anybody could uh, kind of sit back and just rest on what's been accomplished in the past, it would be Paul. Or if you think, well, if anybody's going to be discouraged and just want to give up, it would be Paul because he's in prison unjustly. And yet the Bible says that wasn't his spirit at all. And the same zeal that he had in his life for Christ after his conversion, he still demonstrates that here. And look what he says. Look what he writes in these verses. Verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. And the Apostle Paul says, I'm not satisfied at all. I'm still pressing on toward the mark of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what I'm looking for in my life. And he sets the example for us that this is exactly what Christ wants all of us to demonstrate in our lives, whether we're youth, whether we're children, whether we're adults. This should be the spirit in our heart. Jesus makes this provocative statement. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Christ says this. 
He said, you need to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And you think, well, now that sure rocks my world. Be perfect. I can't be perfect in the sense that I'm sinless. Well, no, that's not, that's not what's suggested. But he's saying this, that you are to strive to be like your Father who is sinless, who is perfect. And you can in your life, you can give up certain sins that have a hold on you at the present time. Those can be given up. You can get to a place where you sin less. And we should be striving for that and striving for perfection in our character, in holiness, in love. You can grow in all those dimensions. And Christ is saying that's what is expected of you. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is is perfect. Then you look back here in our text in Ephesians in this fourth chapter, when he says in verse 13, he says that you become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So maturity is stressed throughout the scripture. And it's powerfully presented here in this passage of scripture. But that's, that's God's will. God's will for your life. Growing to maturity in the faith. In fact, he speaks in in strong ways against believers who do not do this. Now, 1 Corinthians is pretty close by. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and look what he says to these believers at Corinth, because they had this problem. They had accepted Christ, but they were not maturing. They were not growing. And he makes the comment, chapter 3 and verse 1. He says, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. You are mere infants in Christ. Here you've accepted Jesus and you haven't made any progress at all spiritually. You're still babes in Christ. He said, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. And then he points out to them how they can know this. He says, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men, just people who are lost? And he says, you're so confused spiritually. He said, you're caught up in saying, well, I follow Paul and another. I follow Apollos, who are just mere men. We're just men. He said, what's Apollos and what is Paul? And he goes on to say, it's the Lord that we serve. And I get caught up in the men. But there was great carnality, unspiritual in their walk with the Lord. In 1 Peter, Peter says this, he just writes to them and he says, he said, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in your salvation. And when you think of the great commission that Jesus gave in Matthew, in chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Christ declared all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And then he said this, I want you to go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And listen to what he's saying there. He said, you need to make disciples, lead people to know Christ as Savior. And then in a sense, he says, mark them. Now, you don't put a mark on them, but baptism is like a spiritual mark because it's where the person who's accepted Christ is publicly setting themselves apart and saying, hey, I've given my life to Christ. Jesus died for my sin. When they go down the water, they're saying, I'm dying to my sin. Christ arose from the grave. When they come up out of the water, they're saying, I'm risen to a new life. I have a new life because Christ lives in me. But that's not the end of it. Because he then talks about maturity because he says this, teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But teach them. And this is a growing process. This is a maturing process. So when I start thinking, trying to evaluate what's God's will for my life, well, I can know this. He wants me as an individual believer to mature in my relationship with Him. But now there's this. How does this maturity occur? How does it take place? Well, look here in our text. Look what it says in verse 16. It it makes a comment, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's an important statement. There are a couple of things involved if you're going to mature in your faith. One is this, the body of Christ must be involved in this process. 
You do not do this by yourself. Do not be deceived and think, well, I can handle this myself. What I'll do is go on a self-improvement program, just a self-development program. I'll take the Bible, and I'm going to read the Bible every day, and I'll just pray, and that's all I need. And I will grow in my faith and grow in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, that may sound good. Unfortunately, a lot of people subscribe to that. There are many people who just drop by the wayside. You know, in, in our convention alone, the Southern Baptist Convention, there are 16 million members. You know, 6 million of them, we, don't even, we can't even account for them. We don't have a clue where they are. More than half the ones on the rolls of the church, and it's true for other denominations because others decline more, half the people we don't even see. So obviously some of them, they either they're not concerned at all about maturity or they just think for themselves, I can handle it. I can take care of this all by myself. And the Bible underscores repeatedly, you cannot. Now, why is that true? Why is it that we need brothers and sisters in Christ to help us in assistance? Well, one reason is this. You will not be faithful in doing what is necessary for growth. You just will not. And you may start out with good intentions. Well, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. But I want to tell you, for growing, there's more involved than just reading your Bible and praying. But you won't even do that on a consistent basis if you're not around other believers. Now, I see these advertisements on television all the time about workout programs. And what they're always encouraging you to do, just buy this DVD. You can plug it in at home. You can do the workout by yourself at home. Here's the Insanity Workout. Just get this DVD. Here's P90. You just get that DVD. Put it in at home. You just do it by yourself. Now this guy that did Insanity has a dance routine that he's doing. They look like they're having great fun, and here you get this, plug it in, you're going to be in great shape. Well, listen, I, I can't speak for everybody in this room, but I can just tell you this about me. Uh, there's no way in this world that I'm going to do something like that by myself. I will not be able to keep going in that. I'm involved over here, as many of you know, in a boot camp, and others are too. Jay Raymer's in that with me. Uh, Sarah Biggers is in that. Uh, Cindy Christoph, young lady in our church, comes sometimes. Coley Bailey comes sometimes. But there are other people involved in that camp. And listen, if I'm going to do that and put out that kind of effort, I have to be in with people because it's inspirational to see them, to motivate you to realize, okay, they're doing this, I can do this. They're putting forth this effort, I can put forth this effort. I need to see them for that reason, but I'll tell you what, I need to see them for another reason. If I'm suffering, I need to see somebody else suffering. You know what I'm saying? There's no way I'm going to do that by myself at home. And when I see them, but they keep going, well, then that inspires me to keep going. When I listen, the Christian life is exactly like that. I mean, it is motivational when you get around other believers and see their walk with Christ and see what they're doing and how they're serving the Lord. And then in times of suffering, which there will be those times of suffering, then we need to see other people who are going through challenges and how they're dealing with that and the hard times that they have. I watched uh, last evening a Billy Graham telecast, and I saw this lady. I'd never heard of her before, attractive lady, and she was a speaker. She speaks for Christ. And this lady, looking at her, she is married to a, a, a key Christian leader. But uh, when she was a young lady, she was immoral. She was in drugs. She was an alcohol, and you look at her life, you'd never think that of her. And she gave her testimony as to how she was at the end of her life almost. She felt she was so discouraged in her life, and then she met Christ, a janitor in the church, a custodian. It wasn't a pastor. It was a custodian in the church. Told her that God loved her, and she went back to see him when she was back in her home. And he talked to her about Christ, and she accepted Christ, and Jesus dramatically changed her. But she went through some challenges, as all of us do. Listen, when you go through those challenges, when you're suffering, when you're trying to give up sin, it's good to be with other people who are, and you see them, and they're not giving up the fight, and that motivates you and challenges you. When you go through and incur losses, the loss of a loved one or some financial setback, to be around other people who are going through those same things, that motivates you and encourages you. 
But I'll tell you what, you don't have that. You don't have that if you don't associate with other believers, which he's calling for us to do right here. And so you miss out on that. You just won't keep doing it. And then here's the other thing. You're not going to receive the insights, nor will you have the understanding that you need. Because those who are gifted spiritually, he writes to these spiritual gifts here, who could use their gifts to assist you and help you in your development, they will not. And it's not because they don't want to, it's because you won't let them. You're not around them. You never subject yourself to that. Now, you might say to me or someone like me, well, now you're a pastor, so you have the gift of pastoring and preaching and teaching, so I guess you don't need this. Well, that's certainly not true. I listen to ministers all the time on the radio. I listen on television. When I was at camp this week, I filled up two books of notes just listening to that speaker and writing things down. I need that just like you need that. I need the experience as a blessing to me to get to be in one of those family groups the experience of the small group. All of us need those experiences. But you miss out on that, the use of spiritual gifts in your behalf when you just think, I'm going to do this all by myself. And then here's the other thing. You will not have the prayer support that you need to grow into maturity and to excel spiritually. You just will not. On June 6th of this year, it was the 69th anniversary of D-Day when our allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy. And it was a miraculous undertaking, and they won the victory that day. And if you see any movies about D-Day, or you see documentaries on what occurred, you can fully understand this. One person could not have won the victory that day. If one person from the United States had stormed the beaches of Normandy by themselves, and they're going to take over and win the battle. There's no way. You say, well, you're foolish to even bring that up. Anyone could know that. Well, certainly anyone would know that. Now, here's what's astounding to me. People who can readily see that and understand that, when they start thinking about life as a Christian, they don't understand about the great enemies that we face. I'm telling you, spiritually, we face more enemies than they did at D-Day in terms of the ones they had to face physically, and it was monumental what they had to deal with, the the opposing armies. But the spiritual armies we have to face, here's individuals, and they think, well, I can do this all by myself. And they're not being spiritually rational when they say that, because the enemies we face, Satan, the ruler of darkness, the demonic that are orchestrated under Satan, and that take Jesus Christ out of our lives, Satan and the demonic have more power than we. The culture in which we live, our culture is becoming more and more godless day by day. You go to Falls Creek, it's such a blessing. I think there were like 6,000 students down there this week. And you see that and think, everybody's a Christian. Everybody in our culture loves Jesus. Nonsense. The majority of our culture reject Jesus Christ and the life that he's called us to. And you take a stand for Christ, do it now, down there. Or when we're in Christian groups, we can be encouraged and people will applaud us. Take that stand out in the culture and see how those people react to you. There's a gentleman on television, he's on the Comedy Central station, and he made this statement when Osama bin Laden was still alive. He said, I'd rather see Tim Tebow dead than Osama bin Laden. Now, that's stupid. That's absolutely ridiculous. But the culture that pulls us and tugs us away from Christ. And then the depraved nature that's within us. I saw a sign on a church here that was up this week. And it says, only God is perfect. Man makes mistakes. And it spells mistakes, M-I-S-T-E-A-K-S. I misspelled the word, of course. Only God is perfect. Man makes mistakes. And I just thought, Well, that's sure not strong enough. They need to put up there, God is perfect and man is depraved. And we don't like to think that. We want to think, no, 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 that's way too strong. We just need to talk nice about ourselves. The Bible says there's nothing as wicked as the heart of man. And every one of us have a sin nature within us that pulls us and tugs us away from Christ. Now, here's these enemies we face. Satan, the demonic, the corrupt culture the sin nature within us, and some person thinks, 
Well, I can handle this. I can take care of that. I'll just read my Bible and proud grows Christian. That's more foolish than one person trying to storm the beaches of Normandy. It is impossible. You cannot grow in your faith unless you are associated with other believers. It is absolutely impossible. And the Bible stresses this. Look in verse 13. It says this, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, we, we do this together. And it says down in verse 16, From Him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We need each other. That's why the Bible says this in Hebrews 10, 25, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a habit of some is. Do not make that mistake. Anybody that tells you, ah, you don't need church, you don't need to be around believers, that's just foolish. No, they're foolish. You need the ministry of believers. The Bible says if you're to mature, that's got to happen. But here's the other thing that must occur. He speaks of this. Look in verse 13. He speaks of the knowledge of the Son of God. We must be built up in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now notice he doesn't just say any knowledge. You can be a highly intelligent person, and you can be skilled in a particular field of knowledge. You may be, as a historian, well, you may be brilliant. As a scientist, you may have information that other people just do not have. You've got it stored away in your memory bank. As a psychologist, as a philosopher, as a business person, in finance. I mean, you may have all this kind of knowledge, and that's fine. That's great. We should seek to develop knowledge. But listen, you can have all that knowledge. If you're not growing in your understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are spiritually in darkness. And the Bible says that, presents that to us. When he says grow in knowledge, he's talking of knowledge of the Lord Jesus, knowledge of the Son of God. That means we need to know about his life. Now let me ask you this. When you think about the life of Jesus Christ, what do you think about? Well, I would dare say the majority in this room think only of this, the 33 years that he lived in this earth. Well, now what did he do in these 33 years that he lived in this earth? Listen to me. When it talks about knowledge of the Son of God, it's not just talking about the 33 years he lived in the earth. Jesus was preexistent. He's the eternal God. He's existed before time ever began for mankind. And we need to know about the preexistent Christ. Here's the eternal God. And he had all the splendor and the glory of heaven. He's the one who brought creation. He's the active agent in creation. He's the one who's given miraculous occurrences even in the Old Testament that made visits to the earth. When you read of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and that fourth one in the furnace, that's the preexistent Christ. We need to know about that life of Christ. We also need to remember what he gave up in order to come down here for these 33 years. The Bible says that although he was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself took on the form of a servant, clothed himself in human form, and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. The mighty God coming down here to hang on a cross for people like you and people like me. And you think of his life and think of all that he did, but then not just up to that point, we need to consider since he's left this world, what about his life? The Lord Jesus is in the place of authority in heaven, but he's our high priest. We can go to him. We can tell him anything. He sympathizes with us. He'll encourage us. We need to know that about Christ. But we need to know this, that one day this Christ is going to come back to this earth and we will stand before him. He's the eternal judge. But all these things, you need to arm yourself with this information about his life, but it also his teachings. All that he taught. You know, some people, when they think about the teaching of Christ, they think, well, I just need to read in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that's where he taught, and he's quoted some in Acts. That's not all his teachings. He is the Word of God. He is the eternal God. 
the inspired word of God, all of it are the teachings of the Lord Jesus. We need to know all his teachings and what he says if we're going to mature in our faith. Ephesians 4, look what it says in verse 17. He said, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Now you can read that passage of scripture and think, well now these people are darkened in their understanding and they're futile in their thinking and so these people must be ignoramuses. They just can't think. No, these, some of these people could be brilliant. Many of them could think as well as you and I can think. Probably most of them can. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about some mental deformity. He's just saying in the spiritual realm of life, their thinking is futile because they have rejected Christ. In the book of the Acts, in chapter 17, the apostle Paul is in Athens, and Paul is troubled in his spirit. I, I'd pray that we could just be like Paul when we see some of the godless things going on around us, that we could be troubled in our spirit. And the apostle Paul, while he's waiting there, it says this, beginning in verse 16. Let me just read this to you real quick. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city is full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him, and some of them asked him, what's this babbler? trying to say. That's how they defined his life. And others remarked, well, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Well, he wasn't advocating gods. He's talking about one God, the Lord Jesus. And they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus in the resurrection. And they brought him to the meeting, and they said, may we know this new teaching? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about it and listening to the latest idea. Here are these philosophers, smart, intelligent, but blind spiritually. And Paul stood in the meeting, and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. He didn't insult them. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. And he started talking to them about Jesus Christ. But can you see that? They thought he was talking about many gods when he's talking about one. They said, what you say to us is strange. Does it even make sense to us? How can a person who can think... When Paul makes a simple declaration proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, how could they come to that kind of assessment? They're in darkness spiritually. They didn't know about Christ. That was their problem. In Acts chapter, you don't have to turn to this, Acts chapter 26, verse 24, Paul is standing before King Agrippa and Queen Bernice and Festus, the governor's there. And he talks to them about his testimony. He shared what Christ had done for him. And Festus says this, Paul, your great learning is driving you mad. You're out of your mind. This is a governor. It was in such darkness. He couldn't understand the simple explanation that Paul was giving to him about how he was converted and how Jesus had done that for him and what Jesus had done for them. And Paul said to the king, to King Agrippa, he said, King Agrippa, I know that you know about this. You know about the prophets, and King Agrippa responded back, well, almost, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But they just didn't get it, didn't understand. I want to show you one other passage because it explains something. Look in Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm not going to read all these sins. All these sins are listed here, and some people elevate one sin over another sin. Any sin's tragic. 
I just want you to see why the people got into sin. It's a perfect explanation as to why individuals get into sin today. Look in Romans 1 in verse 18. It says this, Paul writes these words, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be made known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Is that not the most strange thing you've ever seen? Instead of worshiping the eternal God, they create idols for themselves, as it says here, of mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Their hearts were darkened, and they got into all sorts of sin, all sorts of sin. Now, why did that happen? Here's a simple explanation. And it's why you and I get into sin. They did just this. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's why they sinned. And any sin that you or I get into, that is exactly what we do. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. You want to get out of sin? You need to do just the opposite. You exchange the lie for the truth of God. You come back and say, Lord, what you say is true. I want to know what you say. I want to follow your word. Then you can have deliverance. Now, I know some could say, well, now look, those people you just referred to, they're lost. And I'm a believer, so there's a big difference. I'm a believer. I won't have these kinds of problems, these issues. Please understand, if you are not growing in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as a believer you will walk in spiritual darkness. People won't be able to tell any difference between you and someone who's not accepted Christ. Here's what John writes in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, or in verse 6. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live by the truth. He said, now, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, purifies us from all sin. But a believer, you can live just like the world. The passage that I read to you a moment ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what he said to those believers, he said, you're still worldly. You're still worldly. You're still just like people who are lost. Even though you've met Jesus, you haven't grown at all in your faith. And you see jealousy, you see envy, you see bickering, you see idolatry because you're worshiping men rather than worshiping Christ. He said, you're just like the world. And that's why if we're going to mature, we must be united with other believers. And we must be growing in our knowledge and our understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. So listen, spiritual maturity, is it happening for you? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Well, in this service, just like in services at Falls Creek or any place else, there are people here that do not know Christ, never personally met Him as Savior. Listen, you're not born into this. Some people think, well, I was born born into a family, it's a Christian family, that makes me a Christian. Or I'm, some think I'm born in America, so that makes me a Christian. No. For a person to be a believer in Jesus Christ, there must be a time in their life where they have understood, Lord, I have sinned. I'm sinful. I'm not a really good person. I've sinned. And Lord Jesus, I'm genuinely sorry for that. And believing that you died on a cross for me and you came forth from the grave, I feel you're the only one because you tell me that.
You're the only one who can forgive me and save me from my sin and from the eternal consequences of sin and deliver me to heaven. And you're the only one that can change my life here in Lord Jesus. I want that to happen. I want to give my life to you. If you had a moment like that, you don't have to say those exact words, but just a time in your life where you've said, Lord, I'm trusting you. If you haven't, this is our invitation for you. We'll sing a song here in just a moment, but even though service will be over, people will be walking out, it can be just beginning for you. This is when the invitation begins. And Christ, if he speaks to your heart, you say, I don't know how he speaks to me. He's not calling my name. If you have a desire inside, just a tugging inside, I can't do that. Music Tom plays up here can't do that. That's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, pulling on your life, inviting you, encouraging you to receive Jesus. And if he is, I hope you'll say yes to him today. If you'd like to do that, when we're finished, you just make your way down here to the front. And we'll talk with you about how you can have Jesus as your Savior. It might be that you're a believer, but spiritually, you could be very immature. And this needs to be a time of recommitment of life, like some of these students made at Falls Creek this week, to say, Lord Jesus, I'm not walking with you. I'm living life just my way. I get upset by things that don't even matter. I get mad at people. I'm jealous of people. I've sinned in my life. Listen, that's not how Christ wants you to live. And I'm telling you, He can deliver you to a better life than that. But you've got to come and be serious with Him and say, Lord, I need to do the things you tell me to do. I need to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. And I need to be growing in my knowledge of you. So maybe just where you are privately, you need to make that commitment. Or it might be as a believer, you don't have a church home. But listen, this is what church is all about. Jesus created the church. This is what it's about. That's why we invite you to place your life here. If you have another church you're involved with and you're faithful there, wonderful. But if you don't and you feel like this is where the Lord wants you to be, I hope you'd come and express that. And we'll tell you how you can be a part here. It's so vital that you link up with other believers. Lord Jesus, you have your will and your way in every heart, every life here this day. For those who need you as Savior, draw them, Lord Jesus, with your spirit. And for believers who need to make a decision, whether it's church membership or whether it's recommitment, whatever it might be, Lord Jesus, urge them, draw them to make that commitment. And Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.